Tonight, we take a close look at the president's first 100 days. He's failed to get any major legislation passed. Yes, he's still doing a victory lap as we speak. White House, they're trying to get tax reform and health care through Congress, but will he be able to get the votes at the end of the day? Former Democratic Congressman Tim Bishop's here to weigh in. Also, the political reporter who says the more Trump loses, the more he declares himself the winner. He's been doing this act for decades. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. Thank you so much for joining us. We're also going to bring some of the comments that you've shared with us this week on those first hundred days. But let's begin with the president, who himself is weighing in on just how he's performed in more than the past three months. Take a listen. It's a false standard, 100 days, but I have to tell you, I don't think anybody has done what we've been able to do in 100 days. I'm not going to touch that one. But anyway, Congress managed to pass a budget deal today, and that avoided a government shutdown that would have fallen tomorrow on that 100th day. But the president, he failed to get funding for his border wall into the deal. He also failed to get any major legislation passed, as I mentioned, including health care and tax reform. Now, a tax plan was sketched out, but it's just a sketchy outline, and it's far from a done deal. But the president and his Treasury Secretary, they're still raving about it. I want to bring in our panel right now, Dominic Carter, political journalist and author, former Democratic New York Congressman Tim Bishop. Mr. Bishop represented Eastern Long Island. And Andrew Whitman also joins us, our senior political correspondent. Guys, thank you very much. And I know what these guys think because I speak to them on a nightly basis, but 100 days ago when this started, <clears throat> did you believe the chaos and dysfunction would have followed to a point where there hasn't been one signature piece of legislation that he's been able to get through, even get through even just the House? Um, I think it was predictable. Uh, I think the sort of chaotic and dysfunctional way uh, that um, the Trump presidential campaign conducted itself uh, was would allow one to predict that the same uh, chaos and dysfunction would attend the, the, the way in which the administration was functioning. I will say, <clears throat> I found it shocking uh, that the Republicans could not get the health care bill through the House of Representatives, and it is a testament to just how terrible the bill that they wrote was. 17% of the American people approved that bill in an environment that is as polarized as ours. To write something that almost no one likes is really, really hard. But, I, you, but you served with Paul Ryan. Yes. Paul Ryan's not a dummy. And Paul Ryan knew of the Freedom Caucus before he crafted this. He certainly knew about the, the folks who'd have to go back to the districts where this would be a tough sell. How could he have presided over such a hot mess? I think a couple things. One, health care is vastly more complicated uh, than even Paul Ryan is willing to concede that it is. Certainly more complicated than the president was willing to acknowledge. Um, secondly... Paul Ryan is a very smart guy. He's also an ideologue. And so he approached the solution from an ideological vantage point as opposed to a pragmatic vantage point. And thirdly, I think he overestimated loyalty on the part of his fellow Republicans to the party and the administration as opposed to their own principles. So I, my own view, and, and I thought this was going to happen. I thought they were going to put up a stink like they did. I thought they were going to, you know, they were going to uh, whine and moan about what was in it, what wasn't in it, what it should have been. But I thought in the final analysis they were going to hold their nose and, and vote for it because I thought they were going to put party loyalty over ideological principle or, or uh, health care principle. I was wrong about that. Uh, the Freedom Caucus was dug in on their principles. And the other thing that I found almost humorous was President Trump negotiating with the Freedom Caucus. The Freedom Caucus guys, say what you want about them, are highly principled guys who care, and I say guys because they're all guys, uh, they, they care about the specifics of policy. President Trump not only doesn't care about the specifics of policy, he doesn't know the specifics of policy. So he was negotiating at the 30,000 foot level, yep. just wanting to get a win, and these guys are at the granular level saying, yeah, but what about essential benefits? And, and essential benefits, 
you know, President Trump didn't know what that was. So. And, and to this point here, Andrew, you had a couple of polls from earlier this week. We can bring them up um, on health care, what the public wants um, and what they don't want here. Uh, well, and I think these numbers also speak to another mistake that Republicans made, which is they underestimated the popularity of Obamacare and how much the alternative would improve the numbers on Obamacare. It's, it's a little less than two to one, but you see 61 percent say, keep and improve the Affordable Care Act. Only 37% said they want to repeal and replace it. And what's more is the, what I call the you break it, you bought it uh, number on, on the Affordable Care Act. this surprised me. This yeah. becomes Trump care the minute anything yeah. changes. Yeah, in fact, it's already Trump care, at least to the uh, two to one ratio, it's already Trump care. Anything that happens with the Affordable Care Act or health care policy in general is on Trump at this point. And that includes if they you know, deny the subsidies and, and sort of work to erode mm. Obamacare faster mm. than it might actually go on its own. Which I think explains why the Trump administration caved on the subsidies. Thank God they did, uh, because the, the insurance yep. markets would be in chaos if they didn't. But the political realities uh, were such that they know uh, that if they didn't pay those subsidies, the f collapse of the marketplace would be on them. Uh, one thing, let me, yeah. can I just say one thing? One of the things that I just find impossible to understand, you asked about Paul Ryan. Um, they write a bill that only 17% of the American people like. In order to make it better, I'll put that word better in quotes, they now move the bill further to the right and take out of the bill yeah. the two most popular parts of the Affordable Care Act, the protection for pre-existing conditions and essential benefits. So someone needs to explain to me what the logic of that is. Well, I want I I to bring to you it. back six years ago. You were doing town halls and Obamacare was a toxic word, yes. and you heard it um, in those town halls. I'm curious, fast forward now seven years later, or eight years later for the next midterms, and this was the scene in 2010 that you had to endure. That looks familiar. Yeah, exactly. Does it become, if you were given free advice to a Republican about be careful where you go on this, this issue, is it actually a net positive for a Democrat to run on Obamacare? Don't touch it at this point. Have we come 180 degrees on the issue? I think we're coming very close to coming to 180 degrees because I think what was going on, that was August of 2009. Not was, that you don't remember. Not that I don't remember. <laughs> but what was going on then was an enormous amount of misinformation. Some of it innocent because it's complicated. Some of it purposeful, like death panels. Um, and people were inflamed, angry, agitated, but under-informed. Now that they see, look, what was the number, 67%? 20 million people that didn't have insurance in 2010 have it now. These are our fellow citizens. That's something we ought to be celebrating. The rate at which health care expenditures increases has, has uh, diminished significantly. The law is less expensive than had been anticipated, uh, and people are getting care. These are all things that we should celebrate. We were told that it would be a job killer. Uh-uh. We've had, what, 76 consecutive months of private sector job growth. We were told that it would cost more than it did. No, that didn't, uh, more than it has. That didn't happen. We, we were told that more people would lose insurance as opposed to gaining insurance, that the exact opposite has happened. So I think as people are willing to come face to face with the idea that they may lose their coverage. If they have a kid with asthma, yep. they may lose it. Then the Affordable Care Act and looks better and better. I, as we've been saying, you can tell stories at this point. It was hypothetical when this thing got passed. Now <clears throat> you'd have real stories. Before I run out of time, Dom, you get the vibe that that dog and pony show with the one sheeter with the 11 bullet points on taxes and people started hearing trillions and seven <clears throat> trillion projected over 10 years, they'd rack up a deficit. Same story, different song, but it's, I don't have any confidence that this is going to run, although Republicans might be able to hold their nose and be a little less principled on this one because everybody likes tax cuts. Do you think it has a better chance of him getting this thing through than he's had with health care? Well, we don't know many specifics, and I think what we're seeing, Richard, is a constant theme <clears throat> during the tenure of this president that the congressman hit on, listening very carefully to what he said. Very good point. And I want, I want us all to think about this. And he made the point on health care. But Trump was up here, and not in a good way, in terms of no specifics. He just wants a win. And the Freedom Caucus 
was down here in terms of specifics. I could not have said it better. And I think that's going to be a common theme of this president. You're gonna be talking to the reporter uh, later, to the folk, you know, no matter what, he spins a win is a win, even when it's a tremendous loss. So I don't put much credence into his tax plan thus far. I find it very hard to call a tax plan when it's only one page. I'd give real money to see any reporter bore down on the president and make it, what's in your tax plan? Give me the details. What's in your health care plan? Give me the details. I don't think he knows. Real quickly, if though, the principle that you touched upon that is there, and it's legitimate for the Freedom Caucus, that they're not going to go along to get along right. on this. Do they feel as principled when it comes to math and manna from heaven is tax cuts? Everybody likes them, even if the deficits conflict with the whole it, it, premise that they have to do pay go. It'll, it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out. I mean, the Republican Party uh, throughout every single day of the eight years of President Obama's tenure decried the existence of deficits and told us that deficits were going to bring us nothing but ruination as a country. Now all of a sudden there's a Republican president and deficits don't matter that much, particularly if those deficits are caused by cutting taxes. Uh, I, the hypocrisy is off the chart uh, and the inability to maintain a rational economic theory is very troubling. I, 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 I do want to say this though. President Trump said that he was going to be a voice for the voiceless. He said he was going to mm -hmm. provide for those that have been forgotten, right? He mm -hmm. said that. He must think that those who have been forgotten are primarily millionaires and billionaires because the... They're the members of Mar-a-Lago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because the tax cut disproportionately favors the very wealthy. 50% of the benefit of the tax cut goes to the top 1%. But if I have, can I have 30 more seconds? Here's, here's the, to me the juxtaposition that just points out how fraudulent his political positions are. He says he's going to take care of the, those who have been forgotten, and he says he's a populist, okay? This is the very same man who is going to preside, who, who proposes doing away with the estate tax, which benefits the wealthiest two-tenths of one percent of American estates, and at the same time, he's proposing a 40 percent reduction in Medicaid, which goes to families that live within 138 percent of poverty. Now, that's populism? Mm. Not in my book. Alternative facts. Yep. All right. <laughs> Coming up next, President Trump gives what may be the most, some would say interesting, others bizarre interview yet. And it's saying a lot when I say that. What he said about Kim Jong-un and North Korea, outrageous. And that was before he tested another ballistic missile. Latest news out of Asia when we come back.